all of a sudden is he's attacking a boy in a toilet. I'm crying for me, Mum. He threatened to kill me. He threatened to strangle me. So you've lost your temper. You've grabbed her around the throat. And before I knew it, she was limp. Welcome to Inside Crime. I'm Leila McKinnon. Our stories tonight all share crucial mystery elements, from a man's heartbreaking search for his murdered brother to an ex-cop and murderer who led police on a futile search for the body of the pregnant girlfriend he killed. But first, a twisted story of a mail bomb, three friends, a suicide, shady characters, a fake death, and one lucky escape. For 17 years, Robert de Heredia was looking over his shoulder, an international fugitive. A man who faked his own death and bolted overseas after being charged with the attempted murder of Brett Boyd in a crime known as the Belrose Parcel Bombing. A crime he maintains he didn't commit. Eventually, the law caught up with him. But unbelievably to some, Heredia beat the rap. He's now officially an innocent man. This is a story you really have to see to believe. A whodunit as baffling as it is intriguing. I've been in a situation which hasn't been, uh, hasn't been agreeable at all. Not at all. But I've never given up. And, I, and, I, and I've got my life back now. The story starts 21 years ago in the most unlikely of places, Belrose on Sydney's leafy North Shore. Back in 1998, Brett Boyd lived in this Belrose house. He worked as a King's Cross bouncer and personal trainer and led a fast life with his girlfriend, the exotic bikini model and high-class escort, Simone Chung. He was very kind, very gentle, um, very strong. He was so gentle. Susan Boyd is Brett's sister and so proud of how the little boy transformed himself into a champion bodybuilder and handsome model. But she wasn't thrilled about the internet porn business Brett started with Simone. I mean, as Brett would say to me, Simone would go out to buy some milk and come back three days later. Bit of a wild girl. For me, he was a great guy. You know, we, uh, I didn't know him that well. We went to the gym together, um, sometimes had lunch together. Good mates, we were mates. He and Brett Boyd would pump iron together at the Trendy City Gym in Darlinghurst. I found him very nice, I must admit. Uh, I never saw the darker side to him. I found out afterwards, yeah, he, uh, he did involve himself in, uh, in, in the shadier side of life, yeah. But whatever he was up to, in 1998, someone wanted to severely maim, even kill, Brett Boyd, Simone Chung, or both. A homemade bomb constructed from two SodaStream gas bottles and bundles of steel bolts was built and wired to detonate in the hands of the poor soul unlucky enough to pick it up. The bomb was addressed to Simone Chung and its sender jammed a postal card in the front door of the Belrose home. It was just after dark on Monday, June 15, 1998, when Brett Boyd picked up the parcel. While one blast did the damage, not all of the device exploded. The area was evacuated and emergency crews took cover. Only half the bomb detonated, yet Brett Boyd lost his left eye and most of the vision in his right. His right thumb was severed in the blast and one of his eardrums burst. 
The bomb was designed to kill. It just looked like someone had got a bucket of black gunpowder and blood. And just thrown it over his whole face. And what stayed with me is this slow, steady drip of the blood running from his left eye. In terms of establishing a motive for this attack, much will hinge on what the victim is able to tell police. The investigation will look into his background and his business dealings. Describe for me the relationship between Robert and your brother, Brett. Mm -hmm. Very, very close. Best mates or? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Interestingly, on the night the bomb happened, I rang all of Brett's friends and he was one of the only people I couldn't get in touch with. Yet there he was in intensive care the next day. If a friend of yours gets hurt like that, it's a normal thing to do to go to the hospital and to see if he's okay. That's a normal thing to do. For three months, the investigation into the bombing went nowhere. But then, a major breakthrough. Convicted drug dealer Lee Stolzenhain, good friends of both Boyd and Heredia, told police that Heredia had confessed to planting the bomb as revenge for a large unpaid debt. Boyd admitted to police that he owed Heredia almost $80,000 and that Heredia had threatened him just two weeks before the explosion. If you read the whole statement, he even said that two weeks before this thing happened to him, that he met me at Rushcutters Bay, and that I said to him, if you don't give me my 80 grand, you're gonna get it. Now, if I had what happened to him, and two weeks before that, someone had said to me, if you don't give me my 80 grand, I'm gonna kill you, then surely that would not be, maybe not the first, but perhaps the second or the third, statement that you would make to police, but it wasn't made until three months afterwards. Three months after the 1998 Belrose bombing, Robert Heredia became the prime suspect. There was the motive of an unpaid debt, and because only half the bomb exploded, there was also DNA extracted from the saliva on the stamps and fingerprints and handwriting left at the bomb scene. The police investigators were building a strong case. They're saying they found a fingerprint on the bomb and that it matches yours. Well, Your Honour, they're not telling the truth. Police claim Robert Heredia attempted suicide just last week, a day after being questioned. For Brett Boyd's sister Susan, this evidence, plus Heredia's suicide attempt, the day after he was formally interviewed by police, all pointed to his guilt because he's thought, you have my DNA. It's a very low point in my life, and, and, and I, I prefer not to discuss it. I prefer not to discuss it. 100% Heredia was behind this crime of attempted murder to my brother. And Brett Boyd agreed that Robert Heredia was undeniably dangerous, turning up to the local police station armed to the hilt to confront the man he believed was responsible for the bomb. Ten months after Brett Boyd was seriously injured in a letter bomb attack, police claim he decided to take justice into his own hands. The fitness instructor was arrested last night carrying a machine gun and pistol near Randwick Police Station, where Robert Heredia, the man who allegedly sent the bomb, was due to arrive. <laughs> then, a couple of months later, in July 1999, Heredia was shot in the car park of this botany apartment block near Sydney Airport. One went through my back and ended up in my chest here. One went through my arm and stopped here, and another one went past my head. They said it was within two millimetres of, uh, of a main artery that came down. Yeah, it was very close. He shot from behind. I never saw him. After you were shot, the police offered you protection? Yes. Can you imagine that? These are the people who were putting things into my apartment in order to secure a prosecution against me. Do you now think I want them to protect me? I didn't trust them at all. So Heredia decided to flee the country after staging his own death. 
Former pay TV presenter Robert Heredia mysteriously disappeared a week ago. On July 28, 1999, his blood-spattered blue Pajero was found abandoned in King's Cross. We are very concerned about uh, his current uh, well-being and his uh, whereabouts. How did that blood get there? I put it there. Went to the airport, checked in and left. Heredia's disappearance is the latest twist in an intriguing case which saw him charged over a letter bomb which seriously injured a man at Belrose last year. I had bullets in me. I've got evidence appearing in my apartment while I'm locked up in jail. I'm not going to wait around to see what the next chapter holds because the next chapter is either death or it's prison. I fear death. For nearly 17 years, Robert Heredia moved between London and Spain. Working as a currency trader and living under the false names of Robert Shorthouse and then Robert Jackson. Meanwhile, back in Australia, Brett Boyd, whose mental health had declined since the 1998 bombing, committed suicide in 2008. But in 2016, when Robert Heredia was 47 years old and thinking the Belrose bombing was ancient history, he was arrested and extradited back to Australia. His life on the run finally came to an end. When they arrested him, Heredia said, it took you long enough, the victim is dead anyway. Now, is that the response of an innocent man? Police thought they had a watertight case against Heredia. They had his DNA from the parcel bomb stamps and his fingerprints on the delivery card. They also had the incriminating statements of both Brett Boyd and Leroy Stolzenhain. But Robert Heredia always maintained he was set up. I didn't touch a card. I didn't lick any stamps. I certainly didn't hand do handwriting just rubbish. It's just rubbish. I didn't believe that my fingerprints were on that card. So I took it upon myself to retain the services of my own fingerprint expert. My, my lawyer said, right, we're going to make an appointment. Thursday, that was. On the following Monday, we received a call from the police to say that the card had been lost. So we were never able to test if the fingerprints were on that card or not. And this is the reason why a court case is fundamental. Television presenter Ros Switzer proved a pivotal witness, indicating Heredia was responsible. She was going out with Heredia at the time of the bombing in 1998. She says that night, the night that the bomb went off, you came home, you were extremely upset. Right. Did you say that? I think it's right? important to mention that that is not the first statement that she wrote. It's important to mention that the first statement she wrote 20 years ago, she said nothing of that. She felt as though she had to give you an alibi for that night, because if she didn't, she could be in danger. Abs absolute rubbish. Ros Switzer declined to be interviewed for this story, as did the disgraced former detective Ray Peaty, who led the investigation into the Belrose bombing. Detective Peaty has admitted to fabricating evidence in multiple cases. I think I, think I was just a bit of a scapegoat. When Robert Heredia first faced trial in 2017, the jury deliberated for five days and ended in a hung jury, so a second trial was ordered. This time, the jury took just five hours to reach a verdict. The result was a massive relief for Heredia, but equally a shock for Brett Boyd's family. I felt so confident, so confident, because of the evidence, the DNA, the handwriting, Ros Switzer, the partner, Brett, what he had said, the debt, and when they said we find the accused not guilty, I literally let out this primal from the pit of my being. <gasps> oh, my God! Oh, it was the pit. And I shot up and I said to Rydia, you did it, I know it, and you know it. I don't remember that, but anyway, yeah. I was a little bit emotional at the time, so I don't remember her doing that. I don't remember. 
But Robert Heredia certainly remembers the moment he was acquitted. It's, um, it's one of the most emotional things you'll go through. It's the most emotional thing you'll go through. I, I, I still remember the foreman very clearly. And they asked him, how do you find the defendant? And um, he said, not guilty. And that was uh, pretty powerful. <laughs> Robert Heredia has now been reacquainted with his Australian-born daughter, Christina. Soon, he plans a permanent move to Spain. As for the other players in this extraordinary saga, Simone Chung, Brett Boyd's girlfriend, became a penthouse cover girl. But her ambitions for fame and fortune ended when she was convicted and jailed for trafficking the drug ice in 2016. Convicted drug dealer Leroy Stolzenhain died of cancer, and Brett Boyd's final resting place is at the French's Forest Cemetery. The people who are going to give me the answers are not with us anymore. I would like to ask Leroy, why? Why did you go with, why did you make a statement against me? I would like to ask Brett, why did you say to the police that you owed me $80,000? Why? But they can't answer the questions. I'm never going to get the answer. I'm never going to get the answer. Daryl Floyd is determined to locate the body of his brother Terry, who's been missing since 1975, suspected of being abducted by a local sex offender. Daryl is certain he knows the killer and relentlessly digs for answers. Daryl Floyd is digging for answers. At an age where many would be slowing down, he works relentlessly on his obsessive hunt for the body of his brother, Terry. This is a long way down. Searching almost 60 metres underground. As you can see, it's not a very nice place. And if we look for the past eight years, he's devoted just about every weekend to digging up this disused mine shaft in Victoria's central highlands. It's not only physically taxing work, for Daryl, it's also an emotional minefield. A lot of sadness, thinking this is where maybe Terry's last bit of our resting place could be. So, yeah, something you don't want to think and try and look out of the back of your mind. But the reality is this is basically where all our information leads us to believe he is down here. Daryl isn't alone in his belief that this man, Raymond Jones, holds the key to the case. He's strongly backed by one of Australia's most successful homicide detectives. And there's a new victim who claims to have survived Raymond Jones all those years ago. Not a day has passed in 43 years without Daryl Floyd missing his best mate and big brother, Terry. You learn to live with it. That's what you have to do. We should be off fishing. Should have been out fishing together. Did it as kids. But that was taken away. It was 1975 when Terry disappeared without a trace. The 12-year-old had spent the afternoon playing Monopoly at a friend's house in Avoca, a town 20 minutes from his family home in Maryborough in central Victoria. As he made his way home for dinner, Terry is presumed to have been abducted and murdered. If he is watching, if he does see this and he, he knows, it's just to come home and knock on our door and he's welcome home here. I don't think he's alive. His parents died before ever getting any answers about what happened to their son. The mystery going on to become one of Victoria's longest and most baffling cold cases. Some other avenues which uh, I need to explore. In 1999, the state's most decorated homicide detective, Ron Idles, took over the investigation. 
and you've got to look at it and say, this is a 12-year-old boy. You know, where did he go? It's not a 55-year-old person that could have just decided to get up and walk away. So I think for the family's point of view, a 12-year-old and anyone in the community, you actually need some answers. In my mind, there's no doubt that he's been murdered, but if you don't have the crime scene and you don't have the body, uh, it's difficult. Terry Floyd was seen by two locals next to a light-coloured Holden panel van that had pulled up beside him. Their description matched the vehicle driven by a known pedophile in town, Raymond Jones. The then 23-year-old admits to being on the road at the same time Terry disappeared, but claims he never saw him. This is the stretch of road, the Evoca Mirabara Road, and Terry was last seen about 50 metres up there. Jones says, I drove this road, and he says, I left at five o'clock, so he must have driven past Terry. He had to. He says, oh, I didn't see him. But if he travelled this road, which he says he did, and it's five o'clock, Terry was still here. It's Jones' previous conviction for the opportunistic sexual assault of an 11-year-old boy in a toilet block, also in 1975, that has particularly worrying similarities to the case of Terry Floyd. If you look at the assault on the boy in the toilet block, it was a sudden urge, right? This wasn't uh, sort of a planned thing. All of a sudden is he's attacking a boy in a toilet. You've got Terry Floyd who's walking down the road hitchhiking. If Jones is responsible, it's, it's like that again. A sudden urge has come over him. What's telling in that toilet block assault is what the psychiatrist claimed Jones was capable of. His belief is because the boy remained silent, he lived. So he's basically saying that Raymond Jones has the potential to kill Raymond Jones is a risk to the community, but he was let back out into the community. Mark Affleck hasn't been back to this spot on the Avoca River since 1968, a day he says he stumbled across a predatory Raymond Jones. He had his fishing rod and tackle box sitting on one of those things, that's when he took his pants and that off. He was just eight years old, skipping rocks with two mates. But what transpired here under the bridge changed his life forever. I suppose it's a bit like coming back to a battleground. You know, one day you've got horror on the field and you come back years later and I imagine it's just a beautiful field. At 59, Mark is now revealing for the first time how he was violently sexually abused by Raymond Jones. I wouldn't have weighed very much at all then. I was skinny. I was sobbing and carrying on, I suppose, and he grabbed me by the hair and pulled me up. I wouldn't do what I was told. I tried to run off and he grabbed me and he shook me that hard by the shoulders. I could feel the bone like hitting with my head rocking backwards and forwards. I don't know how anyone didn't hear me. I was crying for my mum, as you do. Mark says he had repressed the traumatic sexual assault for decades until he saw an article in the newspaper about Jones' links to the Terry Floyd case. And flicking through it, and Pandora's box opened. I just cracked like an egg. I had I wasn't crying so much. I had noises was coming out of me like an animal would make. Just, just, oh, no good. No good at all. It's not just your childhood, it's all of it. It's just, even when things seem normal, they're not. 
robbed me of an awful lot. Another weekend and Daryl Floyd is back, digging at the mine where he's certain his brother Terry's remains were dumped back in 1975. The site isn't far from where Terry was last seen standing next to a Holden panel van. And underground, Daryl has uncovered several nuggets of evidence that make him believe he's closer to the truth than ever before. We believe this is the necklace Terry was wearing on that day. He, he was wearing a necklace when he went missing. Also, I actually had a, a necklace at the same time. So when you look at the design, Jewelers identified that necklace from the 70s era. It's not just the chain. There are also buttons and part of a shoe that Daryl is adamant matches what Terry was wearing the day he disappeared, all potentially vital clues in the search for answers. The tiny discoveries buoy the hopes of Daryl and his army of volunteers that this painstaking work isn't all for nothing. What we are finding are significant to what he was wearing on that day. Shoe, necklace, parts of clothing. We've now got clothing off at forensics for testing, a uh, piece of elastic out of a small pair of kids' jocks, uh, woolen fibre that we believe could have possibly come from the cardigan. All these things, we're not finding anything else bar these specific items. In what is perhaps the hardest task of all, Daryl regularly uncovers small bones. Whoa! Something like that. It's like a, a vertebrae. It's torment having to examine them each time. Most likely they are animal bones, but there is always the possibility that after all these years, Daryl may have finally uncovered his brother's remains. Until you have a look, you just think, could this be part of Terry? Um, yeah, it's heart and mouth stuff, unfortunately, but um, something that has to be done. Hard yakka. Hard yakka physically, hard yakka emotionally. I do this, I carry this burden, and it's only with me, so I'm not going to let it go. And I also made my parents a promise that we'd always look and we'd always find him. I'm going to honour that promise. There is one man who Daryl Floyd believes holds the key to what happened to his brother Terry. That's convicted pedophile Raymond Jones. And it's a view shared by former homicide detective Ron Idles. He was on bail for sexual assault. He has a vehicle similar to what was seen. There's about an hour and a half that he can't account for. So he is a suspect and remains a suspect. I've interviewed him uh, twice. Um, the very first time that I interviewed him, um, he says, I'm sick of it, I'm sick of being hounded, uh, I'm not involved, but again, he can't explain some of the time factors. And the second time, he exercised his legal right and made no comment. I offered him a polygraph. If you pass, you'll never see me again, right? If you fail, I can't use it in evidence, right? So it's a win-win for you. He sought advice and he said, no, I'm not taking the test. Here is an opportunity where he could have eliminated himself and he doesn't. I just think that adds to the weight that he is the most likely person responsible. Perhaps the only hope now for solving this case lies somewhere out here in this bushland. But former homicide detective Ron Idle says needle in a haystack doesn't even begin to describe how difficult Daryl's search is. This is old gold rush country, so it's not just one mine shaft that needs searching. Terry's final resting place could be anywhere around this region. We're in an area that's fairly rugged. There's 60 to 70 mine shafts within a 20 kilometre radius of here. So which shaft is he in? He may not even be in one. But don't try telling that to Daryl Floyd. The rest of his life will be devoted to making sure the truth of his brother's murder is uncovered. If you sit before me now and you give me that option, I'll always take the option I want my brother to be found. That is a God-given thing. My brother does not deserve to be laying in that disgusting mine out there that he is. And you have to wonder, how will Daryl feel if he finally finds the answers he's searching for? Thought about it so many times. Thought about how I would handle it. 
Can you describe your emotions and how you'll be that day? I'll tell you that when it happens. Kylie Labouchardier was about to live her best life, moving away to be with her already married lover, Paul Wilkinson. But ex-cop Paul had other plans for his pregnant girlfriend. These are the last haunting images of Kylie Labouchardier. What really happened to her, one person knows, Paul James Wilkinson and he's not telling anyone. Can you think of anywhere she might have gone? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Very, very manipulative. A pathological liar. Quite incredible, the stories that he actually had made up. Kylie Labouchardier was murdered in 2004, her body never to be found. In life, she was outgoing, vibrant, happy. Oh, yeah, and the bride. <laughs> she was beautiful. She was generous. Um, she was very kind-hearted, very loving, very caring person. When she went into nursing, that's what she did. She cared for people. Kylie Labouchardier and Paul Wilkinson had met before at the hospital where Kylie worked. But this time, something clicked and they started an intense affair. It mattered little that they were both newly married and Paul's wife, Julie, had a baby on the way. He was going out a lot. He would tell me he was going fishing and things like that. Who knows? In retrospect, I don't know. When they weren't engaged in steamy sexual trysts, Kylie and Paul were endlessly phoning and texting each other. In four months, they made contact a staggering 23,836 times. That's more than once every 10 minutes, every hour of every day. That's incredible. Yeah, I, I'm not much of a text to myself, but uh, yeah, they were almost 24 hours a day, you know, seven days a week. Despite the incessant phone calls and texts, Kylie's husband, Sean, was also oblivious to the affair. Like Paul and Julie Wilkinson, they'd only been married a year, but already the relationship was all but over. Kylie's behaviour changed dramatically, absolutely dramatically. Kylie announced to the family that Sean and her were getting a divorce, and their family naturally were very much shell-shocked. Um, couldn't believe that this was actually happening. She didn't um, really give a reason why. And at that point in time, and the family had no knowledge of Paul Wilkinson. Wilkinson's marriage was also doomed. There were tensions in the household. He was constantly on sick leave from the police force, where he worked as an Aboriginal community liaison officer. Wilkinson was eventually sacked because of his appalling work record. And it didn't help that he was a chronic gambler, a fantasist, and a controlling bully. I wouldn't be allowed to wear anything low cut. Um, could have no male friends, only had a couple of female friends that he approved of. Physically violent, threatening, he'd threatened to kill me, he'd threatened to strangle me, yeah. And it was when their son was born that things got weird in the Wilkinson household. To continue the affair, he needed an empty nest. So he concocted an extraordinary story to convince his wife to move out, saying that his police work had put them in danger. Paul then said, we got death threats. It was apparently to do with a case, and he said it'd be safer if I stayed at Mum and Dad's. One that I remember vividly, it was my son's teddy bear stuck to the wall with a knife through it, with a handwritten note, bye-bye, baby. By early 2004, something had to give. Paul Wilkinson was busy juggling a wife, a new baby, and a secret lover. Then, in April, came the bombshell. Kylie was pregnant. Kylie didn't confide in anybody. Um, she was her own person. She was very, very secretive, 
But Kylie did tell one person, Paul Wilkinson. Little could she know that this joyous announcement would seal her fate. We didn't know what was going on. We hadn't met this person. We didn't know um, the control that he had over Kylie at that point of time. Yeah, no idea. While Kylie was looking forward to a new life with Paul Wilkinson, he had other ideas. Nevertheless, he agreed to leave his wife and move with Kylie to Dubbo in central New South Wales. Well, at least that's what he told her. We had no idea that that's what she was planning to do. Two days before her murder, Kylie excitedly organised for removalists to transport her furniture to Dubbo. Then she sent this text to Paul Wilkinson. The secretive Kylie told her family she was going to the country to spend a few days with friends. On the 28th of April, 2004, Kylie set off to meet Paul Wilkinson for the drive to Dubbo. On her, she had $25,000 cash, but she still stopped off to the local ATM to withdraw even more money. This is the very last image of Kylie Labouchardier. She thought she was starting a new life with her lover, Paul Wilkinson, but just hours after these images of her were recorded, she was dead. We kept on ringing her mobile phone and, and like there was no answer. And this was totally out of character for Kylie to be gone days, even visiting friends with no contact. Alarm bells ring within me. Kylie's family reported her missing at Gosford Police Station. And right from the start, police were interested in Paul Wilkinson. Three days later, they asked him to come in for an interview, but he didn't turn up. It soon became apparent that getting the truth out of Wilkinson, in fact, getting anything at all, would be a long and torturous business. Can you think of anywhere she might have gone? Uh, I don't know. 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 Police suspected Wilkinson because they now had the records of the thousands of text messages and phone calls he and Kylie had exchanged. But for the next three years, he consistently denied having an affair with her. Did you ever reply to her SMSs? I did. What, you ring her up or you send her SMS? I didn't um, bring up all that, all that often. All I've got to say about it no more than three times, two, three times. Made contact. He was an experienced liar, yes. I wouldn't say he was a good one, but he was an experienced one. It would appear that way, yeah. But the lies just got bigger and more outlandish. In the days after Kylie disappeared, there was a mysterious fire at Paul Wilkinson's home. He claimed it was started by Kylie, who wanted revenge after he rejected her sexual advances. Can you just... Uh... Tell us a little bit more about the threats, what sort of threats she was making towards you. So there was going to be harm to myself, harm to my little boy and, and harm to Julie. She actually said that my little boy and Julie would be killed. Wow, just, yeah, I, I can't remember the lies of, of so many. At one stage, Wilkinson even tried to frame another policeman with Kylie's murder. When were you aware of this other woman, Kylie? Not fully aware until detectives interviewed me and they told me that he'd been having an affair and the amount of SMSs and the pregnancy. That was a bombshell, <laughs> yeah, 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 very much so. But despite that bombshell, Julie Wilkinson stood by her husband for months. It's now two minutes past three, interview is concluded. All the stories that didn't add up and didn't match and kept changing. Julie Wilkinson eventually saw through her husband's lies and decided to help police. It was the fear of my son's father's done this. That's hard. And soon there was another dramatic breakthrough. Paul Wilkinson sent Julie the following incriminating text. Everyone has a reason for hiding a crime. Call me nasty. Call me cruel. Her family can live their lives in misery for all I care. Fuck them. Weapon they can have. Her? No.
It indicated that he knew the weapon, where it was and what was used. Paul Wilkinson was charged with Kylie Labu Chardier's murder. I lost my temper and I just went straight for the throat. He finally confessed, but even then, he claimed he only killed her because she was threatening his family. So you've lost your temper, you've grabbed her around the throat. And before I knew it, she was limp. I know it sounds like a silly question, but what was Kylie doing at the time? She obviously trying to scream or trying to free herself. There was a bit of a, a, a bit of a struggle. You've dug the hole. Uh, you've then put Kylie in the hole. Yes. And then uh, you put the dirt back on top. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and what did you do with the shovel? I took it. I took it and I threw it in the river. But true to form, Wilkinson's cruel games continued as police tried unsuccessfully to find Kylie's body. I know I've wasted your time in the past, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm beyond it now. Paul Wilkinson led detectives on a wild goose chase. He claimed Kylie Labouchardier's body was buried in Parkland, 48 kilometres north of Sydney. Because of his police background, Wilkinson knew that they would have to take his claim seriously and that they would have to follow up each and every lead. But Wilkinson was playing a cruel game, one that raised, then dashed the hopes of Kylie's family. And he did it time and time again. Last year, he admitted his crime, but led police on a wild goose chase for her body seven times. I was on a emotional roller coaster. There was just days and days I just uncontrollable sobbing. I um I slept with the mobile phone to to my ear. But while police never found Kylie's body, her family did get their day in court and it was the first time they'd ever come face to face with her killer. It had taken five years, but on the 22nd of May, 2009, Paul Wilkinson was sentenced to a minimum of 24 years in prison for Kylie Labouchardier's murder. That was a feeling of absolute jubilation that we had won it for her. Yeah, jubilation. The whole family just could not believe it. Couldn't believe it. I, I was numb, relieved. It was very, very emotional very emotional for, for all of us. The sentence given to Paul Wilkinson today is not enough compared to the life sentence of grief he has given to my family. Grief not only because the former policeman murdered Kylie, but because she and Kylie's father have never been able to say goodbye. I have to reside the fact that we'll never know where the body is. We, we haven't found her. He holds the golden key. He knows what he did that night, and he knows where she is. I'd like to have closure. I'd like to know that I can give her the funeral that she deserves. I talk to her every day. I see this shining star in the sky, and that reminds me of Kylie. And she'll always be smiley Kylie to me.